Welcome to today's webinar titled Timber Framing 101. I would like to thank Timbercraft for hosting this event alongside the Log and Timber Home Show. Our speakers for this workshop are Bob Sternquist, President of Timbercraft, and Dave Markham, Vice President of Timbercraft. They both have over 20 years of experience with designing and building timber frames. Before we begin today's workshop, I would like to host a video from our sponsor, Timbercraft. Timber framing is one of the oldest styles of construction in the world. In fact, it dates all the way back to the Old Testament. That's why we traveled to Michigan and met up with one of the world's greatest timber frame manufacturers, Timbercraft. For over 40 years, Timbercraft has been perfecting the art of timber framing with state-of-the-art design and manufacturing techniques. Timbercraft has taken it to a whole new level. Here at Timbercraft, we are architectural craftsmen that design, manufacture, and install heavy timber frame structures, both for residential and commercial use. Our company was founded in 1978, and our mission is to honor our creator and our craft. What makes Timbercraft a very unique and amazing company is we do a type of construction that's over 2,000 years old. However, we've modernized it. Now we've brought it into our manufacturing facilities so it's a controlled environment with CNC equipment. We actually service the entire country and we build internationally. When you build in different geographic areas, you have different constraints that you have to deal with. On the west coast, you have earthquakes and seismics, or in the mountains, you have heavy snow load. We have the experience to help our customers go through that process and bring their ideas to life and build their dream timber frame home. With a full in-house design and engineering team, Timbercraft is able to design and build structures anywhere in North America. Their focus is to design a timber frame structure that fits each individual client's budget. Every timber frame that we manufacture is going to be very unique because our clientele's wants and needs are very different and we're customizing each project for our customers. Some of our customers have been blessed with multi-million dollar budgets and some of our other customers have much more modest budgets. But one of the great things about a timber frame is anyone could have these big exposed beams. The way that we achieve that is through a process called hybrid. A hybrid timber frame is where you focus the timber framing in high use areas of the home, possibly the kitchen, the dining room, the great room, the master bedroom, a covered porch, the main areas in the house where you actually live. Then as you get into other areas like the breezeway, closets, a guest bedroom, go ahead and conventionally build those. With their unique style and attention to detail, Timbercraft's quality and craftsmanship is unmatched by others in their industry. At Timbercraft, we're dedicated to a particular style of mortise and tenon joinery called the house joint. The house joint is where instead of just the tenon going into a beam, the whole member goes in and then the tenon. And the reason that we do that is as wood dries, it wants to shrink and twist. And when it's in a pocket, you don't see that shrinkage. And if it wants to twist, it can't actually go anywhere. So the process that we do in manufacturing is we take and hand select each and every timber. Then all that detailed joinery is milled on our CNC machines, but that's only part of the process. After that, our skilled craftsmen go ahead, take these timbers and we pre-fit or pre-assemble the entire structure front to back and left to right. We want to make sure that it's a very tight fit and that it's perfectly accurate. And once we're done with that, we go ahead, disassemble the entire structure, label it, stain it and ship it however the customer wants, and then at that point, it's off to be built. But the key to this whole process is our house joint. It ensures that our Timbercraft timber frame is gonna look exactly the same today as it does 100, 200, or 300 years from now. As one of the world's greatest timber frame design and build firms, Timbercraft buildings are built for life. Bob and Dave, I'll let you two take it from here. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, Timber Framing 101. As Taylor mentioned, my name is Bob Sternquist and I'm President and CEO here at Timbercraft. Our webinar today is not really a Timbercraft promotion. It's more 
uh, uh, informational webinar that's going to help navigate you as, as you navigate your way to TimberFrame uh, ownership. Joining me today is um, a gentleman that I've been teaching these webinars and workshops all around the country since 2002, is Mr. Dave Markham. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Dave. Hey, thanks, Bob. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today, and we hope to be able to share with you some more information that will really help you, uh, guide you along the way to, to own a timber frame and, uh, and, and living out your dream. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to email either one of us. It's real simple, bob at timbercraft.com or myself, dave at timbercraft.com, and we'll be happy to get back with you, and uh, either by phone or by email and, and answer those for you. So we really appreciate it, and, and so with that, We'll get started. Um, Timbercraft has uh, been around since 1978. It was actually started in, in Port Towns in Washington by Charles and Judith Landau. We really specialize in both residential and commercial timber frames, uh, both uh, design and construction of them. Uh, our plant has the unique uh, ability of having two uh, CNC milling machines, we'll talk more about later, but it really helps increase the accuracy and the production time to, to get your timber frame to you as soon as possible. Okay. We also are very proud of our, our, our full-time in-house design and engineering department. We think this is a real important piece of the puzzle that you'll hear more about during this presentation, um, how important that design aspect is to your, to your project. And, you know, really our core products here at, at Timbercraft are the timber frames themselves, the design services. Uh, we also offer pre-finished uh, uh, PNG for the roof and, and uh, second floor systems and the SIP enclosures for your walls and roof. So that, that's that's our core product and we uh, I'll turn it over to Bob to get us started here. All right, thanks Dave. Okay, so what exactly is a timber frame home? Um, these are two homes. The top one happens to be my house. Uh, the, the other house um, they look like an ordinary house because see the key to a timber frame isn't necessarily what's happening on the outside of the house. It's what's happening on the inside of the house. Um, whoops. Um, the timber frame is basically the exposed structural skeleton for the structure. And one of the coolest things about a timber frame is that you have the ability to timber frame one room, two rooms, up to the whole house. It's a method of construction. And what we're doing as an industry is pretty much kind of focusing it in the high use areas of the home. Now, the history of timber framing, a lot of people are surprised to realize it's the oldest style of construction in the world. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament where King Solomon hired the Sidonians to come in and um, to build a temple for the Lord. He hired the Sidonians because they specialized in felling timber. Um, that's how old timber framing is. Now, the Gonzalez Alvarez house in Florida happens to be the oldest timber frame structure in the United States. It's just shy of 600 years old. And the reason it's still standing is when the roof had a leak or had a broken window, those issues were fixed. So the elements were kept off of it. So when you're building with big exposed beams, clearly the structure is going to live a very, very long time. Now, timber framing was the main style of construction. Anything built prior to 1870 here in the United States is some form of post and beam or a timber frame. But it was about the 1870s, 1880s, where timber framing took a step back. And really the main reason for that is it's, we, we began mass producing the square head nail uh, dimensional lumber. A lot easier to throw a two by six over your shoulder than an eight by eight timber post. But pretty much timber framing is the original style of construction here in the United States, Dave. Right. And what we get uh, a lot of times people ask us, what's the difference between the post and beam and the timber framing? We hear those different terms. And really what it comes down to is just the method of joinery, how they're connected together. Now, the timber frame is actually the true mortise and tenon that's held together by oak pegs, like you'll see in this picture right here, um, where post and beam is, means it's fabricated and held together with metal joinery kind of after that industrial re revolution. Now, at times we have to combine the two. Uh, for example, um, well, if we're, you're in an area where there's seismic conditions or certain snow loads in that, uh, engineering may require that there's some, temp there's some steel in that timber frame as well. And in a lot of cases, we'll slot that inside the, uh, the timber itself, put in a steel knife plate, and, and then cover those bolt holes with uh, plugs to make it look like a like true timber frame as well. Now. Uh, here's a good example of a, of a house. Um, Bob mentioned uh, earlier that there, you know, this can can look like any other house on the outside. 
this one has a little hint of what's going on in the inside. I like doing that with the, with the, the timber porches, for example, and that. And the maintenance you're going to have on the outside is, is really just like any other wood house. If you have a lot of wood on the outside, you know, you're going to have maintenance. If you have a, a little bit of wood like those uh, those porches that are covered, um, it's going to, it can be very minimal maintenance, maybe every three to five years freshening that up. Now, the inside, there's really very minimal maintenance on the inside because you're not exposed to the UV rays from the sun, the, the acid rain, the weather, that type of thing. So um, when these timber frames go up, um, typically we either have them pre-finished with the oil or stained for you ahead of time or they can be stained, uh, come out raw and stained afterwards. Um, really, the only um, maintenance, if you will, on the inside of a timber frame home is dusting off the big beams once in a while. And other than that, you don't have to worry about it. Um, a lot of people uh, want to know more about that because we have we do a lot of log and timber frame shows and, and a lot of people that started out buying timber frame homes came in looking for logs and then they realized the maintenance is involved in them. And I know I used to go out and, and restore these log homes and media blast them, restain them, jink them, all that good stuff. There's a ton of maintenance that's involved with it. With the, with the timber frame, you get the beauty of that home on the inside and, and you can actually do one room, the whole house, or anywhere between, like Bob mentioned earlier. Now, the timber frame industry today is really comprised of two different types of companies. There's the small hand cut companies. Um, this is really where all of us started out at, you know, was, was actually, you, know, you see Edgar here, he's cutting out a housing by hand, chiseling it all out. And, and back when we were doing that, we were really kind of limited on the amount of frames we could put out in a year because uh, our average was about one man, or one stick per man per day. So with five guys out working in the shop, you know, you could only get, you know, five timbers done in a day. So you were limited to anywhere from maybe two to ten frames max a year, depending on how how big those projects actually were. Now, today's industry is is, is more um, CNC. This is this is the technology part of the, the equation. Probably about 20 years ago, Hundiger, which is a, a German company that specializes in machinery just for timber framing. And uh, if any place, anything that's cut in the United States, or, or probably most of the world for that matter, that seems to be cut is probably cut on a hundred acre. That's, that's kind of the, the, uh, the uh, crescent wrench of, of these tools as it goes. Really the uniqueness of this is it takes away a lot of the mundane stuff and, and really speeds up production. Um, the guys have found that there, there's still some hand cutting and things that need to be done, valleys and, and complex angles, that kind of thing, arches. But really, as uh, you see here, the machine go, or the timber's going to the machine there. It's very quick. It does a lot of the, the mundane part of that cutting for the, the crews before they have to do the hand finish work. Uh, here's the timber getting ready to go through the four-sided planer. So it, every one of these goes through a planer to get four-sided squared up before it goes into the machine there to make sure it's, uh, it's perfect when it comes out to your house. Exactly. All right, guys. Now let's let's talk about some questions to ask uh, the timber framers as you go through this process. And one of the big things here is just figure out what the different packages all the different companies offer because it's going to be very different. For example, here at Timbercraft, we do timber frames, we do uh, pre-finished uh, ceilings and floors, we do the exterior walls uh, exclusively in uh, structurally insulated panels. Other companies will also do windows and doors, uh, the full lumber kit. So specifically, you're going to want to ask as you begin this journey to each company is what what is included in their overall packages. I think mostly as an industry, I hate to say the shell, but I think we kind of build the shell of the house because as a timber framer, we can go geographically all around the country and still be cost uh, competitive if we stick to kind of the shell of the house. Now, always the local roofer, the local uh, flooring guy, they'll be more economical in those aspects, but in terms of building the shell, I think that's probably what most customers are gonna wanna look for as they begin this journey. Now, another really important thing is going to be the design services. Um, there are some, the different services that timber framers offer are going to vary. Um, you do want to make sure that you work with a, a company that has in-house design. And the main reason for that is, is that the building requirements for your job and maybe a job 20 miles north from you will have different engineering requirements. So you're going to want to find a company that has this in-house design. Um, some companies exclusively focus just on the timber frame. Um, I think there's an advantage to uh, working with a company that does the architectural design as well. 
And one of the things, you know, as, as you're beginning this journey, I think what would you do want to find is someone that you connect with, someone that, that can take what's in your heart and in your head and extrapolate that out on the set of plans. Now, maybe that's an outside architect or an outside residential designer. It's absolutely perfectly fine to work with uh, an outside company, but definitely involve the timber framer early in the process. We have familiarities with spans and capabilities. Also, very important, the cost of building the, the timber frame. And I think that all needs to happen at the same time. Now, Dave and I, back uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, like 2006, 2007, we were doing um, this workshop actually in Charlotte, North Carolina. And unbeknownst to me that I had connected with a customer in the audience, and she made a decision that I was going to build her timber frame. And when the workshop ended, about 40, 50 people got up, and I got their information. She came up. She goes, Bob, give me your card. I'm going to contact you in 90 days. I'm really excited to work with you. Well, about 90 days later, I got a set of plans in, and it um, it even said, see Bob Sternquist for timber frame details, and she loved the hammer beam. Now, the hammer beam is a, is a very cool, unique truss, and we're going to show you some examples of that later. But one of the things that had happened is that the architect who had designed her house had no familiarity on spans and spacing. And one of the things this architect had done, they had designed the house with a nine foot eave height for a hammer beam. Well, the challenge with using that particular truss is it would have meant I would have had timbers about three feet off the ground flying in the room at a 45 degree angle. And what I ended up having to share with this customer is, hey, we can't do a hammer beam. We can do some other trusses, but she's like, no, Bob, I really, really want the hammer beam. So I had to share with someone who had spent over $15,000 with an architect designing a beautiful set of plans. We had to redesign her home if she specifically wanted those trusses, and she did do that. For me, I would have been devastated to spend that sort of that much in funds towards a design I would have to redesign because I didn't involve the timber framer. But had she picked up the phone and said, hey, Bob, um, I want this, I could have shared, hey, at least do a 14-foot eave height. I could have shared some really important information. So that's why I always encourage definitely involve the timber framer during the design if you're going to work with the outside um, uh, design firm. Also, one, one thing that's really important is that timber frame and log structures are very kind of unique to building departments, and so a lot of states require engineering. So make sure that the timber framer does have in-house engineering as you begin to go through this process. Now, another really important question to ask is who's actually going to raise this timber frame? Because this is going to vary. Some companies will only provide you with um, a written instruction book on how, how to lift it. And the mass and size of these, it is a unique skill to be able to do to raise these. Now, this is a project that I, I raised over in Port Orchard, Washington, um, over in the Puget Sound. Now, this was a contractor that had a full crew, but what they did is they hired me individually. That's me in blue. Uh, I wish I moved that quickly. But I, I actually went out and taught the, the general contractor how to raise these and what the sequence that's required. Um, another option that we offer here and most other timber framers also offer are four-man crews. So, you know, certainly ask, hey, Will I at least have a tech rep? I mean, find out who's going to help you as you go through this process. Because one of the key things that you see here, we're not lifting this with two by fours and draft horses and ropes. We're actually using a crane. And a crane can be very expensive. And that's where you want to at least have one experienced person that can help navigate you and move you through this process as you begin to go. Now, another important question to ask is going to be the timetables. Timetables vary depending upon the time of the year. When customers call Timbercraft, for example, in February, our lead time is only eight weeks. Call us in May, our lead time is gonna be about 12, 13 weeks. So find out what, what the lead times are for production. In my opinion, in our industry, I find that the spring and the fall are, are our two busiest times a year. And the main reason is in the fall, customers have decided, let's go ahead and get the structure up before the snow flies, before things get cold. So certainly, you know, find out what the lead times are. And Dave touched on this in terms of how are the timbers crafted. Uh, hand, hand cutter, CNC, both are excellent timber framers, but certainly the hand cut timber frame is gonna take a little bit longer. You're gonna have a larger lead time with that compared to the CNC environment. Now, the next question, I think this is probably maybe the most critical question to ask as you go through this process. Find out. 
do the timber framers actually pre-fit the frame, front to back and left to right? Here at Timbercraft, our jobs are all around the country. So when our product leaves our manufacturing facility, we have to be dead set positive that everything fits. So that's why we fit it front to back and left to right. Because if something goes wrong, I can't run to Home Depot and buy another timber. I need to make sure that we catch if there is a mistake actually in our facility. There are some companies that say they test fit. The challenge that I have with test fitting is they're just making sure that the tenon goes in. When we fully pre-fit, we make sure that truss is perfectly square and then we drill everything out. So make sure that you are finding a manufacturer that truly pre-fits their frame front to back and left to right. Um, another important one is gonna be finishes. Find out, do they, do they finish the structure? Um, here at Timbercraft, we happen to stain all of it because one of the things we know about wood is it shrinks a little bit and if you stain, a timber frame when it's first cut it shrinks you'll you'll see shadow lines so find out do they actually finish the structure ahead of time in their facility because I think that's real important but one of the things that really separates all the timber framers is going to be the main the primary wood species that they work with so certainly ask the companies what species do you recommend for my project now um, in terms of there's there's all kinds of different wood species that you can use but certainly Douglas fir, oak, pine, in my opinion, are kind of where the whole timber frame industry is. Now, the characteristics of these woods, and we'll talk about that in a minute, are very, very different. Now, this is a gentleman over in our uh, lumber yard over in Riddle, Oregon. That's where our Douglas fir comes from. It comes off the coast of Oregon. Now, if you notice, he is, he is six feet tall. So that is an enormous size timbers that we're harvesting. So with Douglas fir, um, we're, we're able to get very large big beams and it tends to be free of heart and I'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly but depending upon whichever wood species you're going to work with are different variables now most of what we're doing as an industry is we're working with green timbers green timbers are timbers that have recently been cut down so there's still a lot of moisture in there and so as as green frames and what we like to do when we work with a green material here at Timbercraft, we like to have it cut, bring it in. We happen to air dry or partially kiln dry the wood to allow some of that shrinkage to happen. And then we cut the joinery and then we send it out to site. Now, basically the way timber framers charge, there's two key variables. One is material cost, the other is production time. And so green timbers and air dry timbers are gonna be your most economical approach as you go through this. Another option is to kiln dry, but kiln drying actually adds a significant expense to the cost of your materials. Now, the way, when we say kiln dry, basically it's where you take these big beams and you put them in a microwave and you microwave them. To radio frequency kiln dry a timber, it's usually two months, 58 days these beams go in there. Now, the reason why this is so expensive is, for starters, the wood is harvested and then it's sent to a specialized kiln that dries the wood. So you have some expense there. However, when you microwave wood, it's very similar, and I've always used the hot dog analogy. What happens when you microwave a hot dog for one minute on a paper plate? You put it in the microwave, you cook it. The moisture comes out, it kind of checks and moves a little bit timbers do the exact same thing so when we when we kiln dry timbers we usually have to put in a beam that's one to two inches bigger than your desired because we know it's going to twist and turn a little bit and after that happens we then bandsaw it down so the expense in kiln drying is going to be the shipping to and from the kiln the oversize and then you're actually probably losing 10 to 15 percent of the material because we know it's going to check we know it's going to move and we have to bandsaw it down kiln dry is a great option but it will probably add about 40 percent additional to the cost of the timber frame package now another option is going to be reclaimed timbers in terms of character off the chart coolest things in the world um, these old uh, timber frames that you see falling down in the country that material is still good now obviously the areas that's rotted is not but what we do as an industry is we actually cut that rot off and then we bring the timbers in but this, in my opinion, reclaim is even more expensive than kiln dry because usually you have to pay someone to buy the barn. You then have to pay a crew to go disassemble the barn. And then when you bring it into our facility, 
because of all the different things over the 100, 200 years that may be in those timbers, we can't put it on our CNC equipment. So what we actually have to do is take wands and go over and try and find all the different steel that's in these timbers. We remove it and then we cut the new joinery. Now, I have a man cave above my garage and one of the things I did there is I did a reclaimed timber frame bar. Absolutely beautiful. We wanted all the wood, we looked for all the steel, but you know what happened once we started cutting the joinery? We found some bullets that had been shot into the, these old timbers. You know what those bullets did to my uh, saw blades? Nothing good. So it's it's just part of, it's just part of uh, the process. But here at Timbercraft, we actually have to hand cut those. And so the, the production time's longer, the material cost is more. So that's why overall it's going to be one of the, the most expensive ways for us to actually actually go go through the process. Now, one of the things that's really important to kind of jump back with the green timbers is that timbers are going to shrink a little bit. They don't shrink lengthwise, they shrink around the waist. Now, in traditional joinery, you would have a post and you would have a girt and they would come together and the tenon would go in. But in traditional timber framing, post and girts were covered with lath and plaster. What we've done as an industry is we've learned that wood itself is not a great insulator. So we're now using energy efficient walls and roofs and we move the timber frame in. So all of the joinery is now exposed. That's why it's critically important to make sure that you do this step here called the house joint or a pocketed joint. So instead of just the beam touching the post or its connection point, we're actually taking it in one inch. We're putting it in an inch. So if there is some shrinkage, it happens inside. If it wants to check or twist because it's a box heart wood, it can't go anywhere. It's actually in a pocket. So what you see here on the screen is the most desirable style of joinery. Now this here is an example of a, of a non-house. This is truly traditional Morrison tenon joinery. Now, when this was first cut, it was nice and tight. And overall, in the timber frame industry, there are excellent manufacturers out there. In my opinion, where you see the quality and craftsmanship is not really year one, year two, it's year five, six, and seven. It's what attention did they pay to how it's gonna dry? Now, when this was first cut, it was beautiful. But 10 years later, this is the quality of joint that you're going to end up go getting if you don't have a house joint. Now, in designing a timber frame for your budget, you know, we've talked about fir, oak, and pine, cedar are kind of the main wood species that we work with. Certainly, Douglas fir, oak um, are the two strongest wood species. People are surprised to learn that Douglas fir is a little bit stronger than the oak. And the main reason for that is, is that oak weighs six pounds of board foot, Douglas fir weighs only three. So it's half the weight. So the weight of oak um, just gives it a little disadvantage, which makes Douglas fir the strongest. Cedar and pine, I think, are some of the most beautiful wood species, but doggone, they can barely hold themselves up. So it's one of the challenges when you when you work with those different different wood species like that. So your options overall is to timber frame the entire house, but truly where we're at as an industry are hybrid timber frames. Now, a hybrid timber frame is where you focus it in the main areas of the house. Um, maybe, for example, like in my son's room, if I would have put timbers in his room, he would have had ropes around him and swinging from side to side. Now, that wasn't an ideal place for me to put timbers. So we focused the timbers in the kitchen, the great room, the master bedroom, the main areas where we live. And anybody that has a realistic building budget will be able to have a timber frame through the process of hybriding. One of the other things that maybe you already own the perfect property because the outside of your timber frame can be whatever you want it to be. We're doing a lot of timber frames additions, maybe adding timber frame great rooms. It's part of the ver versatility that you have with our, our product. But truly, again, as I mentioned, hybrid timber frames are definitely the key. Now, this is a project that I did in Ohio. This is a customer that had a modest budget, and I went through and timber framed just the center section of the home to give them that wow factor. So this is actually their timber frame after two days on site. This is what we had um, unloaded the truck and built for them, and these are the finished photos. Now, her laundry room, sure, we could have put timbers and built her the coolest laundry room in the state but we didn't, we just focused it in those high use areas of the home. And that's one of the keys to hybriding. One of the other things that I did, this is a picture of my office, my own personal word called trimbers. I, 
when we hybrid, we tend to do a little bit of trimber framing. So because I, I didn't want to start contrast from going from my great room into my dining room in my office, I added these beams. They're just trim. They're just hanging out up in the ceiling. People think that I have uh, structural timbers in there, but truly, Dave, it's just cosmetic beams. Right, and the, the idea behind the trimber framing is really you don't have all the fancy joinery on the ends of it, so it's it's much less expensive to produce. You have just the cost of the timbers with end cuts on it, and so that's where we can put that in different areas of the of the house to, to keep the cost down. One of the other things I wanted to bring up, just because I I noticed when when Bob was talking there, he was talking about checking, and I and I assume that most people that if they've been around the industry a while understand what checking is, but I had a a, a little joke that, that kind of um, helped clarify that. They call it checking if you like it or cracking if you don't. Okay, <laughs> it's a necessary evil of wood, especially with box tart. With box tart, you have the center or the heart of the log in the center of the log, and what happens as it starts to dry, a check or a crack will open up and dry towards that heart. With that free of heart that we were talking about earlier, it's cut outside that heart and it eliminates about 70% of the, the checking, uh, cracking, if you will and twisting stuff. It's much more stable material. So that's why we pri primarily use the free of heart dug fur uh, in our projects. Now, the next thing is, is we talk about bents or trusses. Now, a truss is the triangle area you're seeing right there with, with the legs. So basically, uh, a, a bent, we're going to refer to as a truss with legs, if you will. A simple bent is, is only seven pieces here, you can see. So this is going to be the mo most inexpensive style of bent because, as Bob mentioned earlier, the two costs that primarily go into the, the frame itself are the big pieces of wood, the timbers, and materials, and then, of course, the joinery to connect them all together. So the less timber pieces you have, the less joinery you have, the more cost effective. Okay. If you add two more timbers to that, for example, on this a little bit wider great room right here, um, this is what we call a queen post. It's on either side of the center of that, of that uh, bent. And those are called the queens. Um, it, it, this works out really well. This particular one was out in Michigan, and this was uh, uh, they wanted the loft area that had a great big window in it. So we put the queen post in for the first bent, and then the, the next bent, if you'll slide next slide, Bob, was what we call a king post. Now a king post, you can see that it's got this timber running right down the center of that right there, and that, that's what designates a, a king post. This is probably the most common style you'll see. In, uh, in timber framing throughout the, the country because this is you know, kind of the oldest style and, and it's, it's very traditional. Now, as you can see here, this king post is a simple one, so it's not much more than what the, the uh, simple truss was, just has one inch of timber. Now, we can get fancy with those as well. If you look over to the right a little bit more, that cool pavilion with the, with the curved roof on it, we actually took oversized timbers and cut the arc on the rafters to create that look of more of a rounded style uh, roof on it, that steel roof. Um, below that are some really neat decorative timbers. These are what we call trimber framing as well because they're not structural, they're not holding anything up. But you'll see they got a really nice arch bottom that's super popular right now. That's kind of the hottest thing we're seeing going on. And below that is a, is a large uh, king post with struts. That's Like I said, that's the most common what you'll see. A lot of stick builders will, will put these little things that they make out of two befores up in the gables and that to give it that timber frame look. But, you know, uh, you know we're all about the big mass timbers. Now, exactly. Next, next, um, you, you know what, Dave? Uh, one of the things that I found is um, th these are all great points on the king post. The king post, in my opinion, happens to be the oldest style of truss or bent um, that's out there. Um, in 2010, I went with my parish on a Holy Land tour. I wanted to see where all the miracles in the Bible happened. And e at each one of those locations, they built churches. And these churches were 200, 400, and one was over 600 years old. And the one thing, you know, as I got to Israel and I started my journey, I also realized I was going to go on a timber frame tour of the Middle East. And the style of bent that I found in every single church was the king post. The only thing that was different is those little 45 degrees, as Dave talked about. Um, there, there was additional struts coming off of it. So just, just a little tidbit, Dave, I, I found it to be the oldest style of truss that there is, um, you know, that, that I've ever found. Absolutely. And if you like something a little more modern, we're, we've done a lot of scissor trusses over the last probably 10, 15 years. These are, you know, a little bit more decorative. Um, you know, like I said, they give you more of a modern look uh, to, the, to a house like that. Um, so they're, they're pretty popular as well. Now, the next truss you'll see is a three-post. 
Uh, three post is a great truss for a wide uh, area or a wide room. As you see, of course, it's called a three post because you see the three posts going one on each side and one side down the center. Um, very traditional and, and two-story houses. Um, the next one here popped up is a four post. Okay, these are we see them in, in everything as well. These were very traditional of old barns, where the center section would be the area in between the the base for the, the cows or the horses. Um, so the pay loss of above and such. It also works great to put a fireplace right up in there. It frames a fireplace really well. Um, you'll see one here in the background with our crew standing, you know, looking at. Uh, you can see the the the, uh, the beauty of the the of the uh, scenery in the background right there. So four four posts is, gives you actually the widest fans you can go um, by stretching it out and, and and transferring that weight over four different posts. Now the hammer beam. This is probably my favorite truss. And it's also one of our most expensive ones. And, and the reason why is simple. Just look at it and see. There's lots and lots of pieces in there. There's a ton of joinery. You see those tenons coming through horizontally at the top. Those are called through tenons. They're, they're for looks, but they also add additional strength. Down at the bottom of those two queen posts coming down, you see pendant ends. Those are really cool because you can be customized. We can do acorns or spear or ball style, different things you can add onto those uh, to, you know, to make it unique to your own home. And, and typically, with a, with a timber a hammer beam like that, you can only go up to about 28 to 30 feet. Now, what we've been able to do, if you look at the project to the left, this was actually a, a giant great room. This was 38 foot wide. So what we did was we added another pair of queens to that, and they did a double hammer beam. And that was able to really clear span up to 38 feet in this particular uh, instance. And the picture of the right is uh, once it was, uh, the TNG was on it, and uh, it was uh, uh, covered with, uh, or, or stained uh, on the inside. And that's one thing you'll notice too in some of our pictures. We really like to, to make sure that the TNG and the um, timbers themselves uh, have a little different color to them. Where, you know, if you have a different color, uh, like the natural color of this TNG and the stain on the timber, it really makes the timbers pop. Or if you use the same exact colors, they kind of blend in. It doesn't give you, I think, as good a look. So, what, what we'd like to do now um, is show you my house and in, we built my house in 2006 and one of the things that we needed to do for my wife i'm a builder um, my family for five generations have been in the trades um, so i could see the floor plan i could see the timber frame but we actually did some 3d renderings in 2006 to be able to explain to my wife exactly what it is that we have. Now, my great room on my house is 25 feet wide. Now, as Dave talked about, I used a four-post bin. It was a great option for me to frame my fireplace right in the middle. Now, I happen to be a bird hunter, so up, up above, I have different birds mounted. So my, my first bent happens to be a four-post bent. Now, my second bent in my great room we went to a king post because the one thing we don't want, we don't want a three post. We don't want a post coming down in the middle of my great room. I wanted a clear span. So we went with the king post as bent number two. Then on bent number three, we did a three post bent. So in my first three bents, we switched to different styles, all kinds of different things. Now, if we look up above, my kitchen is on my left. We look up in that loft in the elevations, we even added a three post bent in the in the elevation up in the loft we added another king post so you can mix and match all these different styles now one of the best resources that i have found in the 20 years that i've been building timber frames has been timber home living they have done a phenomenal job of going around to timbercraft and all the other manufacturers in featuring our homes so so you'll it's a great resource i can't tell you how many customers come in and they have printouts or tear outs you know from Timber Home Living, hey, I like this color, I like this style of truss. It's a good resource. I don't get paid for that plug. I just, I really believe in how, how important it is overall in the process. Now, for example, in my master bedroom, we didn't do a fancy truss. We just did a shed roof coming off the side of my, my timber frame. Has a very neat wow factor to it. And then when I built my garage, I actually did a gambrel bent. Um, you know, I love these old barns that you see in the country. I realize why as a country we're building pole barns. It's a fraction of the cost of, you know, building a big structure, um, be it stick frame or with timbers. But I just love the gambrel bent state. I think it's one of the most most unique styles that we have in the industry. Oh, absolutely. And one of the, you know, one of the questions you want to ask your, your timber framers, what type of wall and roof are they recommending? 
Now, stick framing is, of course, a, a very common option. There's also another one called SIPS that we're going to talk a lot more about in just a moment. Now, this is a project we did in Bozeman, Montana. And as you can see here, we put, after we put up the frame, they went back through and they just stick framed all the rest of it and, and did the zip system to try to help seal it up and keep it insulated. So you, you can actually put you know, a timber frame in a, in a stick built house as well. Now, this is an example of a very well insulated um, house that's stick built. And this, this is a, what's called a thermal imaging camera. Camera. What a, cam what a thermal imaging camera does for you is it actually goes through and measures the heat or heat loss or cool in this particular picture. So if you look at here, you see you can count every one of those sticks that are holding this uh, up. So those are, are and a lumber in, in a wall like it is essentially about an R6. So that, why you could count all those is that's where your heat loss is coming out. Now this next picture is a more traditional house. This is a uh, a stick built house that has the bat insulation, which is most common in, in most uh, homes, and that's just the Pink Panther uh, fiberglass insulation. Now, the one below that is the same exact house done into a SIPS. And the difference in the colors are, like I said, the blues and greens are the lighter or cooler colors, the reds and oranges are the hotter colors. Well, the, what that's showing there is your heat loss throughout the house in the wintertime. And you, as you can see, the windows all look the same. There's a lot, a lot of loss out through the windows. But on the stick built house above and on the roof, you can see a lot brighter colors where that heat's coming through. So actually, that's one thing to definitely ask, you know, what do you recommend? Do you, are you stick framing or are you uh, using panels you know, for the house? Exactly, Dave. And I think, I think overall, the reason why timber framers tend to enclose their structures with SIPs, if we think about a timber frame, there's usually a tall, steep room. And in traditional construction, that's a booger to heat and cool. So timber frames are desperate for energy efficiency. However, structurally insulated panels do need ridge beams, occasional rafters to sit on. So it turns out that the SIPs need um, Timbers, timbers need energy efficiency, so the happy marriage, as we call it, I think that's that's pretty much why you see a lot of manufacturers actually utilize um, the SIPs. Exactly, and and I'm a little biased because I've been doing SIP for over 23 years now, since when I built my first house, and I was getting ready to stick build a house because that's what I used to do. I was I was a stick framer, and I ran into this concept of the SIPs um, at a, at a, a show down in Toledo, Ohio. And, uh, you know, after I started talking with the guy and listening uh, to what he had to say, I was like, you know, kind of a light bulb went on and said, man, this, this makes sense. They're super energy efficient. They're solid core of insulation with no thermal breaks in there. That's going to save you a lot of money. I said, so basically what it is, uh, uh, SIP is a structurally insulated panel. It's an acronym for that. And, and it's two layers of OSB with a solid foam core in the center. Now, what we tend to refer to it as, you know, Bob and I talk about it you know, when we're talking about SIPs as an ice cream sandwich. So everybody's had ice cream sandwich, so they understand the, the, the two skins with the solid core in the middle. And now these aren't near as tasty, but they insulate much better. Okay, so the two different types of SIPs are, the first one there um, is called an EPS or expanded polystyrene. Okay, that's about a 3.17 per inch of our value. And the good thing is it's very structural, and when laminated together, it creates an I-beam effect. Makes it extremely strong. It's about five and a half times stronger than a stick built wall and three times more energy efficient. Now, the one below that, the second uh, other style of SIPs is a, called a poly polyurethane SIP. Now, these are fabricated a little bit differently. Instead of being uh, laminated together, these are actually, they build the framework and they inject the foam into it. Um, one of the advantages you see here is they can put the electrical boxes and things in for you ahead of time on those. Now, Bob, I know you know you've done a lot of work with um, with um, uh, EPS and polyurethane, so I know we're going to talk about both of them. But you know, like I said there, there's not a one size fits all in this equation, is there? Exactly, and that's that's well said. Um, there's there's pros and cons to to both of them, and because here at Timbercraft we're a nationwide builder, um, we offer both both products. Um, they, they are different. Now, for example, with the EPS, uh, here are some of the wire chases that you'll predominantly get, and it's basically melted out. Um, so this is the type of wire chases that you get with the EPS. My passion in the 20 years I've been building has been the polyurethane. Now, this is an example of, of how we frame up the polyurethane. So we actually put all the dimensional lumber in ahead of time, and then it's injected. And you know what? 
it's not a laminated process and since we're injecting it what else do we want to put in there as dave talked about with the with the polyurethane we can actually put all the electrical boxes conduit uh, for example when i design a kitchen and i know that we got kitchen cabinets i actually add another layer of osb so instead of just having a half inch to hang my uh, cabinets on i have one inch of material to be able to hang them so the, the polyurethane is a good is a good uh system but it doesn't fit every sort of project now kind of the pros and cons and the differences between the eps and the polyurethane is the eps is more of a mass production so they laminate a bunch of panels and they cut out the windows and the doors um, so since it's kind of a mass production, it, it's actually going to cost a little bit less than the polyurethane. However, the lamination process were, is a little bit stronger. So on the West Coast, where you have seismic conditions, EPS is a great panel to work with. Now, the polyurethane um, has a higher R value per inch than the EPS, but it doesn't have the same uh, structural characteristics. And because we're making each panel individually, there's a little bit longer lead time with the polyurethane. Um, but overall, EPS or polyurethane, you're going to get a great panel system. And I know, Dave, you're, you're really familiar with these R values, so I'll let you kind of explain that. Sure. Like I said, I, I've been doing this for 23 years. I've got just shy of 290 uh, structures under my belt. And so I'm a little bit biased. You know, I think it's the only way to build. It's the only product I know that pays you back month after month, year after year, for as long as you own the home. Um, give you a quick story on that because we have a little bit of time. Uh, I built my first house out of, out of SIPS, and uh, it was actually uh, EPS SIPS like we're showing here. I used the six and a half inch panel, which at, you know, at 40 degrees is giving an R24 in the walls. I used the 10 and a half or 10 and a half inch panels in the roof, so an R39 or essentially an R40 in the roof. Okay, I built a 2,800 square foot house, 16 foot vaulted ceilings with a big ridge beam going across to hold those up, and I did the worst thing you can ever do to an energy efficient house. I filled the whole back a little full of glass. I put a big nine foot slider in the master bedroom. I put a six foot slider in the great room. Two great big sliders in the in, in or two great big sliders in the great room, one in the kitchen, and then there's a small window in my in my son's room. So essentially the whole back was glass because I filled it fifty foot off the water and I wanted to enjoy as much of that view as we could. And I find out big big sliders like that are less expensive than big windows. Well that's where most of your heat loss is. But with that insulation value I had from the SIP walls and the SIP roof, my highest heating bill for 2,800 square foot sitting on a full basement that was heated as well was $84 a month. And the cooling bills were a fraction of what they'd be in, in normally as well. So, um, like I said, SIPs either way you go are, are going to be you know, a much, much preferred way of building for, for paying you back as it goes down the road. Now, as Bob mentioned earlier, the polyurethane ones, they have a higher R value. They're closer to an R7 per inch. So what that means is going to equate to is you're going to get thinner panels. So you can take a 6.5-inch EPS or a 4-inch um, uh, polyurethane and get the same R value. Uh, you can go to 6.5-inch uh, panel for the roof on a, a polyurethane, which is going to be a 10.25-inch in EPS. So there again, um, you know, it just depends on where you're building. We'll look at the, the codes and, and the seismic uh, and, and recommend what we think is the right package for you when it comes to the SIPs. Now, here's uh, some important questions to ask about the SIPs. As, you know, like I said, what do they recommend for your particular area? Because Bob mentioned earlier that in certain areas, you can drive 20 miles away and have a whole different snow load, a whole different seismic condition. There's there's a lot of different things that are, that are involved in that. But one thing we always recommend is Two things basically. One, whenever possible, get the jumbo size panels. Okay, these things start out life as eight by 24 feet long, so the big, huge sections of walls and roof that go up really, really fast. Um, the, the larger panels you have, the less seams, more energy efficient. It also goes up much faster, so it saves you on labor. I know some companies out there say, "Well, we built four by eight panels, so you can lift them by hand," but you have to put six of those up, and the same time you put up one jumbo panel. And so if you think about the labor from the process net, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I did a project years ago with Amber Crombie and Fitch. I, I went out and taught this crew. I was out there for two days training them to put a, a panels up on a, a place called um, uh, was outside Columbus, Ohio, Amber Crombie and Fitch World Headquarters. And they'd never seen these panels before. And after two days' time, I had them set in a panel every 20 minutes. Yes, I, I taught the guys how to prep them, how to rig them, and how to put them up, and they were just amazed. And this construction crew was a really good commercial construction crew that had never used these before, and they swore by them after that. 
Also, the other thing is always, always, always get the pre-cut panels. You can buy raw panels as well, but they're again on that first house that I built. Um, the, the GC talked me into to buying the, uh, the pre uh, the raw panels and cutting them on site. And um, you know the only way to cut these things out on site is with a chainsaw, basically. And so while he's cutting the windows and doors out on site, and I'm looking around at all my neighbors watching the house go up in awe, and then seeing all these little white beads fly all over the place. Next thing you know, I'm out there running around the yard with my shop back trying to suck these things up so I don't, uh, you know, make all the new neighbors mad. So pre-cut panels are, are more than worth the cost to have them done unless you're doing a, a, a barn or something that doesn't have windows or has very few. But like I said, for the most part, they're, they're uh, head and shoulders above the best or above the, the, uh, the uh, raw panels. And I know, Bob, you've had some experience with, with drywalls and TNG on, on panels as well. How sure. that work out for you? Well, you know what? One of the cool things about the insulated panel is that you have a layer of OSB. So you have it on the inside and the outside. So when it comes to drywall, it's super easy because you have wood everywhere. You're able to attach it. But one of the key things that you want to keep in mind is if you're building a timber frame, is that if we go back to the timbers, remember they shrink a little bit, they shrink around the waist. So if you butt your drywall right up to, let's say a green piece of oak, which shrinks a quarter of an inch in three years, you're gonna have a quarter inch gap. So one of the keys here, particularly one of the things that we do here at Timbercraft is we actually design a five eighths inch spacer on the back of our timber post. That way the half inch drywall can slide back behind there in case there's any shrinkage. So what that does mean is when you paint, you do have to cut in, make sure you get your your um, your paintbrush just slightly behind to get that in there. Um, but I'm telling you, hanging anything, cabinets, anything, you have always be everywhere. Now um, on the outside of the building, it's OSB. It's just like an ordinary house, whatever type of siding, hardy plank, wood shingles, all of it is an option. Now, um, there, there are some companies out there that are pro-offering laminating the TNG directly onto the insulated panels. Now, as an entrepreneur, um, I started thinking about that and said, wow, when I normally raise a timber frame, it takes two to three days for me to raise a timber frame, and then I have one, one whole day, maybe even a half of another day, climbing all around this timber frame and installing the tongue and groove. And so I went ahead and I sent all of my pre-finished ponderosa pine out to this um, company and they laminated my TNG to the panel because I started thinking, wow, I'm going to save all this money. I'm going to be able to set the panels with the TNG. Now, if you look at that photo, you notice that there's straps and there's slings going all the way. Now, my finished product was on the bottom. And when you typically fly these in, you land them on the timbers, you slide them down and you slide them over. Slide them down, slide them over. Panel after panel after panel. As a panel installer, you know, you climb up, you normally set one, one side of a roof. And then you come down just because the balls of your feet and your calves are really sore from being on the steep pitch. And that's when I looked up and I realized all the scuff marks on my beautiful ponderosa pine. The one thing I didn't budget for was the was one day to go up and palm sand the entire structure and then to mask off the timbers and reapply the polyurethane. There are some companies that pro offered to do it. As somebody who's probably set 80, 90 panel jobs myself, I don't quite know how. That's why you normally climb up on top of the timber frame and stall the TNG. Now, as a guy that walks beams way up in the air or walks roofs, you know how nice it is to have uh, a tongue groove deck on the entire ceiling to be able to move around. So, so typically, one of our suggestions here is to avoid getting, um, be at the drywall or the TNG laminated ahead and just account for that. And also another important thing is just gonna be the different warranties that all these different companies are gonna have. Now, if you'd like to learn more about structurally insulated panels, go to YouTube uh, or go to the Timbercraft Facebook or Timbercraft website. And uh, But in particular, it's really easy to find with YouTube. Just search Timbercraft Built for Life and you'll see all the different webinars that we've put together. We do have an hour long webinar with lots of detail, both on EPS and polyurethane uh, SIPs. So it's a, it's a good learning resource for everybody, Dave. Yes. Now the last few critical points we have today are SIPs, you know, like I said, the structural characteristics are, are, are like an IP. When you laminate these together, that's what makes them so strong. People don't think this OSB and this foam together, and individually, they're not very strong, but when you laminate them and glue them together, it makes them incredibly strong. Like I said, about five and a half times stronger than a stick belt. But one thing you got to remember when you build a SIP house is you got to, got to, got to have an air exchange system on it. You got to bring fresh air out and, and, and 
or fresh air in and, and exhaust that moisture out because just from taking some showers and from cooking, you can create enough steam in the house to cause a problem if you don't have it ventilated. You know, uh, SIFs are also very, very, um, very strong when it comes to, to fires. I've had a project up north that, that one side burnt through the outside of the chimney all the way through the inside skin or outside skin all the way through the foam and melted the, on the inside of that uh, uh, second foam. We went back in and actually jacked up the, the beams on the roof, pulled off six panels on the roof, pulled off all the side walls, and in three days had it back shelled in. Um, the, the company that was looking to do the, the repair on it wanted to stick to them. The owner said, there's no way that the fire marshal told me this thing would have been burnt to the ground if it wasn't for the SIPs. So it's one, definitely, uh, I think it, that's another key point to SIPs, and they're very green. They only have about one-fifth of the lumber in a, in a uh, SIP house that you have in a stick built house. So you can build five more, five more houses for every stick built house. Now, um, next thing is, is what do you need to get started? You know, how does this work? Well, it always is great if you have a floor plan or a concept, even a sketch. We'll work, start with you and work from there. You need to know the location of the property. Um, some pictures are great because that helps us understand things a little better until we can get out on site and look for the, the exact place you're going to site it on site. But it gives us an idea of how to, to start uh, designing this and, and optimizing your views. The other thing is the budget. You gotta gotta you know give us a, a budget to work with so we can work with you on it. Our our job is kind of to be the budget police and work on with this with you to make sure that you can afford to build this. If you have it done by if this is designed by an outside designer or architect, they're focusing on the design and the looks of it. We're going to focus on the design and looks also. We'll make sure that that. When it's all said and done, it's affordable to you and you can build it. Because really, if, if this we go through this whole process and, and you have it house designed and you can't afford to build it, you know, we all lose. Okay, that's how we feed our kids is, is by being able to uh, produce this home for you. So we, we always recommend keep your, your budget, the timber frame portion of your budget, no more than 20, 25% max. Um, so you have enough to build, you know, to keep the, the rest going. Exactly, and I think I think that number of 20% is really a good number, particularly if you're going to hire a general contractor. Now, certainly, if you're hoping to put some sweat equity and do some other odds and ends, you may be able to push that that up a little bit. But again, it's really important that you're focusing on the budget and the overall house overall. That way, and that's why hybrids are so popular because anyone with a realistic budget can have a timber frame via the hybrid path. But as Dave talked about, what are what are what's the design flow? How do we actually um, build it? Now, this is an example of a house that I got over um, over on Mount Rainier in Washington. This was a customer sent me their sketches. Um, and this is actually a lot more than what I normally get from customers, but it was the overall feel that he wanted. So what we did here at Timbercraft is we took his sketches and then I put some sketches together, kind of trying to expand it a little bit. And this was the schematic phase. We just wanted to get the right feel and make sure that, okay, conceptually we have 20% allocated for the timber frame and this is the the, the floor plan that we're able to do. The next step in the process was getting that pricing confirmed, but getting it actually in the AutoCAD into the 3D um, realm. That way they could actually see we detailed all the different. Now this happens to be a hybrid. It's fairly heavily timbered. We have a really, really cool porch that goes off the great room, that kitchen dining area, all of that is open. But then off to the right was a bedroom upstairs and a master suite downstairs. Now, even though this was a hybrid, it feels fully timber frame because we still needed the structural timbers to support the SIP roof. So this is more or less um, how the design process goes as you build. And here is the, um, the colored in 3D rendering that we did. And then here is my picture of Friday. We started the job on Monday, and this is as far as we got by the end of the week. So you can, you can see how what we designed and what, what delivered actually came out to be the exact same thing. Yes, and, and, and like I said, we're, we're uh, running out of time, so we want to, to, there again, ask you, feel free to let us know if you've got any questions. You know, send them to bob at timbercraft.com, dave at timbercraft.com. We'll be glad to get back with you about it, and we really appreciate uh, during these trying times you taking the time to, to uh, uh, you know, watch our, our webinar. Hopefully you learned something from it, and, and it was good for you. We really appreciate it. Uh, God bless, and, and uh, have, a, have a great day.
Absolutely. And hey, if you also get a chance, definitely like us on fake, Facebook. Um, once once this world settles down, we're going to have timber frame raisings, different open houses. It's a good part of the process. Uh, and as Dave said, we really appreciate you watching our webinar. Take care. God bless. We'll see you later. Thank you for a great presentation, Bob and Dave. As mentioned, if you have any questions, please reach out to bob at timbercraft.com or dave at timbercraft.com, and they will be sure to get back to you. On behalf of our sponsor, Timbercraft, and the Log and Timber Home Show, thank you for joining.